Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, your hyper-empathic fundamental link between all humanity condensed down into a single entity. And today is time for the final episode of Xenoclash. Uh, it's going to be a bit longer than usual because there's no easy place to break it into two episodes and uh, it's only a little bit longer than an ordinary episode, so let's jump right in. There's only one gate into Halston. Why are we taking the long road to it? Cat's brothers and sisters are looking for you on the main road. Incidentally, the main reason I haven't been talking over cutscenes is that there's kind of a bleak emptiness to this world, which is often emphasized by the music and the soundscape. And wow, what a lovely skybox. Yet another good skybox in this game. Um, uh, anyway, so I feel like it lends something to the tone if I'm if I'm not constantly quipping over the sorts of vague, strange problems of these people. Hi there. That's a really nice pig you have there. Pig? No, it's not a pig. Or at least not just a pig. This is my son, Gosney. Some months ago, I was surprised too when I saw my little boy look like a pig. I've never heard about that. It's never happened where I live. It took me a little time to get used to, but now everything's fine. Isn't that right, Gosney, my little boy? I want you to remember this woman when we're in Halston, but you must get ready. There is someone dangerous following us. What are you talking about? You should go to the coast and prepare to fight. You're an easy target here in the open. Go where you can hear the waves. Go where sounds echo against the coast wall. Any children? No, not yet. But I like one of those too. So this pig, uh, remember this pig, and also remember that it looks a lot like the pigs out back yeah, of the. I think that fence leads to the coast. Yes, just follow the path down. But this isn't a good time for fishing. You have to watch out for the crabs. Out back of the uh, gate gang's place. Also, I just want to take this moment Let's to point out. Post. Stop interrupting me, God! Everyone's really rude today. Uh, I just want to point out that it has been what, like, eight episodes, and uh, even though we've just been invited to watch out for crabs, I have not once made a fisting joke. So thank you very much. Uh, I will take my accolades and move on. Also, I love the anachronism of this strange. Well, I mean, it's not strange. It's a Rubik's cube. We all know it. But this is such an unreal world. It's so fascinating to see such a clear and distinct object from our world. It kind of lends something to the surrealism. Anyway, as I was saying, remember that pig, because it's very similar to the pigs they had out back of the gate clubs. Uh, not gate club, gate gangs clubhouse. Once again, Deirdre is basically just in this game to open doors for us and be explained to. Actually, that reminds me. I love that the way she phrases the strange discovery about that pig um, kind of emphasises the whole sort of primordial mind nature of these people, which I talked about previously. There's something about she, the way she phrases that. It's not really a joke, the way she puts it. Um, I've never heard of that. It's never happened where I live. It's it's delightful in that way, but it does it does continue to um, contribute to that particular air. Is he referring to his squirrels? Because I don't really see how uh, squirrels will help him find me uh, at that kind of remove.
The majesty of this. I didn't think we'd have a chance to play again. just occurred to me, I forgot to grab the bombs that were up at that uh, nice lady's house. I'm not sure why she needs a small pile of extremely dangerous explosives, but... So he is absolutely shooting the birds out of the sky right now. There's a whole bunch of them around here and you can in fact see them dropping as he shoots them. So, um... All those bird rights advocates out there who, who gave me flack for kicking a bird once, I want you to really come for this guy. Like, absolutely show up in numbers and show him who's boss. Because that's what, like, 12 birds he's actually shot out of the sky now. It will give me the position of your head. I don't really want to give you head, guy. Is this the horniest episode yet? I think it might be. Anyway, this is kind of frustrating because you just wander around waiting for him to shoot birds. I just want the boss fight to happen, come on. It takes ages. Like, I wouldn't mind so much if I had more crabs to shoot up, but it's just walking back and forth while he shoots birds. This place will confuse me? I can always hit the squirt. So this is actually kind of easier than the previous boss fight for a couple reasons. Uh, you have an additional problem of having to dodge all these crabs that pop up, but his AI kind of breaks pretty easily. Although the crossbow is frustrating to use as compared to the rifle because you have to watch for the arc. Um, if you stand close to the whale he's standing on, you can just spam and he doesn't do anything. I think maybe his animations break. He's trying to throw squirrels, but he can't. As far as I can tell, there's no downsides to this. You can just stay here and do this over and over and over. Just gotta be careful of these. The badump tish as they go cartwheeling through the air is just delightful, I think. Is that? Oh, okay. Oh, jeez, that's not what I meant to do. Anyway, yeah, the badump tish of the crossbow sending a. An ugly crab. No, they're not that ugly. Now that I think about it, they look almost like the mud crabs in uh, Oblivion. I kind of miss Oblivion. Everybody plays Skyrim, and people remember Morrowind very fondly. But I have a, I have a deep and abiding fondness for Oblivion, even if it wasn't as good. Oh shit, he nailed me. I, uh, I got complacent. I was hoisted by my own petard. I was... Uh, absolutely wrecked on the exploding squirrel of uh, hubris. Which I think is an entity from Greek myth. Anyway, not much of him left. How many of these goddamn crabs are there? Are they not? Are they not good eating? It seems like you wouldn't even need to go fishing. You could just put a net down here and eat a thousand crabs. One of the other reasons why this is easier than the other times you fight him is that you can, if necessary, run behind here and hide behind the whale's face. Which then means that all of his uh, horrible squirrel rat things will bunch up, which means that you can freely shoot one of them and explode all of them and then you get some time to shoot him. But that's not necessary because he won't throw any if you just stay here. Ah, huh, lost his gun again. Deirdre, you were not very helpful. You have I'll a rifle. I'll to make sure he doesn't come back from the dead again. You go get Golem to come here. I mean, it's interesting that you think he's dead because um, we haven't successfully killed a single person yet. Um, well, I suppose that's spoilers because of Father Mother. But hey, guess what? Father Mother's not really dead. Uh, we'll find that out later this episode. I think it's very amusing the way they very bluntly mediate your progress by the fact that you can't jump. Um, this would in no way be an issue for any human being or indeed any other character in this world. But uh, for us, the player, it we're forced to, you know, wait for the game developer to let us move on simply by this trick of um, 
wood things falling down when crabs appear next to them. It's exactly the same as the gates. There's no reason Gat couldn't open this gate. But uh, the game demands that you wait for Deirdre. So I'm about to go into one of the best fights of the game, and I want to be uh, on the ball and actually giving it my all, because there is an achievement for winning the fight. And I don't think I have that achievement, so I'm going to see what I can do, but my dialogue will be added, added in afterwards, because I have to focus. Hi there, I'm Future Tessa, and it's been a while since I showed up. I think I only showed up once during the last series, and... Uh, wow, I've really not been used to my full potential. So I am curious as to where Golem disappears to during this fight, but uh thought I was gone already. You're a good shooter, but how well can you fight? To make it interesting, I'll have to keep one hand behind my back. I gotta say that's a classic fight man trick, you know. Drop something and then appear behind your opponent. Very no stylish. Can beat me. I also love his whole look. It's really weird. Uh <laughs> He kind of looks almost like he's wearing um, uh, one of those skin-tight suits but with sequins, except I think that's his skin. I think that's just what he looks like, which is cool. Um, I'm not quite sure why he feels the need to fight me naked, um, or indeed just wearing lingerie. But um, to each his own, I suppose. And I mean, you know, if you can pull it off at all, why wouldn't you flaunt it? No one can beat me. So, this is one of the more thrilling fights in the game. It's one of the few times where you, it might be the only time actually, where you square off against a single opponent who is intended to be a sort of an equal challenge for you. He's supposed to be, uh, you know, as tough as you need the player and uh, a significant challenge. Plus, the fact that it's just him, you don't have to worry about managing multiple opponents or uh, weapon types or anything means that you can actually really focus in and learn his style. One of the flaws with having this fairly advanced combat system um, and having every single different combatant have their own different moves and stuff is that you never get the chance to learn and respond to them properly. Ah, looks like I'll have to take it seriously. Now you have no chance. Because, um, because you're managing multiple of them at the same time, you can't really do the kind of dodge and counter dynamics that you really want to no manage to do. <laughs> So it's nice that they give you this one opportunity to really drill down and learn his moves. For example, there's a particular kind of block he does, which shows he's set setting up for a counterattack, which means you need to be careful about attacking him in that instance. And maybe break his block with a heavy attack. Ah, uh, there it is. That's the thing I was just talking about. It's also worth noting there's a lot of forced holes in this game. Um, the way you get the achievement, and I'm not actually sure if I achieved it here, is by having a certain amount of hit points left by the time you beat him into the ground. Uh, which essentially means that when the forced fail happens, you have a certain amount of your health left. But I think there's, there's like five or six times in this game where this happens. You were winning the fight, but the plot decides it's time for you to get the shit kicked out of you. <sighs> <laughs> I've had enough fun already. Just now. I said I would help you, and that is what I'm doing. Where are you going? To Halston. What's the hurry? What happened? Hey! Kak, come on, Gat. We have to follow him. Sorry. That guy almost killed you. Let me help you up. Hopefully Future Me was full of clever, insightful comments and funny jokes, but um, I have no way of knowing. Anyway, it's back to me, past me, which is current me currently, uh, playing this game for you. 
Can you remind us why we're trying to get here instead of running away? Because once I get into the city, I can end all conflicts. I will open the gate, and in Halstom, you will see how your destiny can change. Do you think he can do it? Hey! The taps were supposed to shoot! We finally get to shoot that car where we'll even get the reward and Wait, everything. Who's that? This is one of the most frustrating fights in the game because there's a bunch of guys, they all have guns, and two of them have a vantage point on you. So one of the tricks to it is to try and make sure that you make sh <laughs> try and make sure you fight them around the back of these houses where Deirdre can help you sh by shooting them. Because you know it's nice that you have a little fire support for once. And the other is to just constantly switch up your target so that you make sure that nobody is getting distance and also a gun, which is the two things that don't taste great together for me when I'm fighting. I think I took one around, that's good. Right, let's see if we get bombed. So, uh, as I said, this is kind of a frustrating fight for those reasons, but he's been doing alright so far. But it also does just keep going on. This is once again kind of a greatest, greatest hits boss rush through all of the various different bizarre fighters in this game. Oops. Be, be nice and wait for my stamina to come back. That's the gentlemanly thing. To do. So, now that I've uh, sufficiently broken enough noses, I get to go do the next bit of, uh, I guess, nope, I have to fight more people. You'd think I'd remember these things, but uh, I don't, so whatever. Rude of you not to keep standing on my bomb. Incredibly rude of you to bring a gun. Why does everyone keep bringing guns to this fist fight? This guy brought a sword, he's rap. I think you'll be like him. Especially you, Zitsu. You suck. No. We'll kill you. I mean, frankly, the resilience of these people is remarkable. Although, uh, it is always fun to see people just completely falling over. Any kind of moving object seems to have a... Seems to have a... Uh, what would you call it? Like a, an impact and damage value to some extent, so it will do damage if it hits, and it will do knockback and make people drop things, all of that good stuff for when you're trying to mitigate a fight with several people. Where are the other two got here? I don't trust them. Bye, Rumat. Oh, okay. Nearly posted on my own petard again. I gotta say, Zitsu saying, I'm gonna fire, is the single most irritating noise in the game that has a fair few irritating noises. I could do with never hearing it again. You'll be sorry. I could also use some magic potatoes, which... Oh my god, they're not going to fire because I'm going to punch you. I'm going to keep punching you until you never say that again. So by this point in the game, on my very first playthrough many years ago, more than a decade ago now, god, um, I had decided that Golem was clearly not a... Wow, nice cartwheel. Um, <laughs> I had decided that Golem was clearly more than a uh, character at this point. I had tr been trying to figure out what Golem was for, what he was meant to represent, and I thought, okay, he's, you know... He's something from the past, which is which is being used, but has his own agenda, you know. He's using these people to his own ends. At this point, I started to suspect he, suspect he was something more metaphorical, more allegorical. He perhaps represented some kind of truth about humanity, or some kind of deeper thing. I thought perhaps he represented the uh, 
intrinsic bonds that connect us all together as, as thinking entities in the world. And that maybe that metaphor is then literalized by the fact that any wound to him is applied to everybody. Um, and I began to think of this as much more of a kind of a allegorical narrative over time, which is a phrase I really overuse, but it's a very useful one. Um, with regards to that sort of thing. But then, of course, uh, the ending, which we'll see shortly, made me uh, think it must have been intentionally all of this kind of mysterious mumbo-jumbo. Let's think about it in deep, great detail and analyse it as a work of literature kind of stuff, you know. Making art rather than making um, content, let's say. Uh, so imagine my uh, disappointment when the sequel came out and just explained what everything was and how it works. Well, I mean, I haven't finished the sequel. I never got very far in it, but it has much more of a... Well, let's not say willingness, but it has much more of the kind of explanation of things that bother me. So, it's time to fight two of these at the same time, which can be very easy or very frustrating. That's odd, it only dropped one hammer. Oh, there we go. So, one of the fun things about heavy enemies is that they can do friendly fire damage to their allies. Uh, both when they are running around and doing charges and attacks and things, but also uh, when you hit them over the head and they go bouncing. Because if you bounce them into one another, much like when you, do, when you hit uh, a normal enemy with a heavy attack, you actually can get them to do a very small amount of damage to one another. It's just kind of funny to me. Anyway, the easiest way is that if you can uh, ideally isolate one of them or sufficiently just wail on them to take care of them, or elephant on them as well, then um, you can wipe one of them out and take care of the other one much more easily. Oh boy. Okay, that's the end for him, I guess. Amazing instance of friendly fire. I mean, I'm not going to complain because frankly it's to my benefit, but still. You'd think they'd be careful. Also, I have to wonder at this point exactly how different the Northgate gang and uh, Father Mother's brood are, because they do seem very tightly connected. Earlier on in the narrative, it's implied that they're not really connected, um, and that they don't spend time together, they don't hang out or have an alliance especially, it's just that Father Mother goes to their pub occasionally. Which is why it's so odd to see how tightly knit they are for the rest. I want to know what kind of hold Father Mother has over them. That they're so willing to help with Father Mother's uh, secret sinister secret. Also a fun thing to note is that they're called the North Gate Gang, but Deirdre pointed out there's only one gate, so... Enough! I'm tired of this quarrelling inside our family. Follow me. <laughs> There's a very honest energy to that cough, I think. They're always presented as intimidating when they're in a group, but I did just kick the shit out of them and all of their friends uh, without a great deal of difficulty. You know, in a group. So, as I said last episode, uh, this game does pull the trigger making you fight its final boss twice on two very different occasions. However, this time there will be some interference. Uh, at certain points throughout the fight, some of your siblings will charge in and join the fight, which 
It's inconvenient because they aren't really subject to the same damage from Father Mother and they will make you drop your guns, which you kind of desperately need. Uh, most of Father attacks won't do anything to them. However, charges definitely will. And if Father Mother decides to drop skull bombs, which is also a thing, then, uh, yep, you got all the for it. You know, you talk a lot about being a good parent, but um, you are kind of sending out your children to fight me, and I have made it clear that I will kick the shit out of every single one of them quite easily. You know, with no real difficulty. Stop getting in the way, Impa. You're my second least favourite brother. And I really don't want to have to say that about you because you are an adorable pig man. Get him, father, mother. Oh shit, what? Okay. Last time I played this, um, Father Mother's bombs managed to destroy Gastonis and not me. Ouch. So, I'm not sure if I should reveal what Father Mother's secret is. We're all going to find out shortly, but, um,. Actually, you know what? I think I will reveal it now instead of waiting for the game to reveal it so that I can talk about it a little bit more clearly. Um, not least because uh, there will shortly be the phrase, Father Mother, you have to stop doing what you do to the children, which sounds way worse than it is. Possibly way worse than it's intended to. Because Father Mother's secret is that Father Mother is not the parent of any of its children. Father Mother sneaks out at night and kidnaps children from their biological parents, replacing them with pigs obtained via the uh, North Gate gang. This is interesting for a couple reasons. One is that um, they will steal your children and indoctrinate them in their, in their strange and unacceptable ways is like one of the OG libels leveraged at gender non-conforming people throughout history. Their freaks who want to steal and be worse to your children is just one of the worst things people say about queer people in general, and it's uh, historically not an uncommon one that it gets said. So that's a huge problem for obvious reasons. However, it's kind of taken by the fact that Father Mother does care about their children quite a lot. And Father Mother, well, shortly we'll see Gat say, I do care about you. I do consider you my, my father and my mother. But despite that, this whole situation is kind of questionable. As a, uh, you know, I would say queer-coded villain, but it's just not even queer-coded. This is, this is a non-binary person. And it's interesting what some of uh, the things Golem says in face of that are too. Because Golem is fundamentally essentialist. That's what he represents in the narrative. Strict <sighs> systems and rules. This is a problem. Behind you! That really sounds like it hurts. Is it worth killing your kid to keep your secret? Is it worth provoking your kid to kill you to keep your secret? Was any of this worth it? You could either tell my secret or destroy me. I'm glad you didn't tell my secret. <sighs> I'm not going to tell. And I'm not going to kill you either. I do consider you my father and mother. You just have to stop doing what you do with the children. Cat wouldn't tell you father mother has a secret, but I will. Things are going to change here. Father mother is neither your father nor your mother. Huh?
he is a male creature, incapable of giving birth to anyone or anything. He took each one of you away from your real fathers and mothers when you were babies. In time, I can prove this to each one of you and show you your real families. There are things bigger than Halston and things bigger even than Xenozoid. This too I will show you. And that's it. That is the end of the story. That is the end of the game. This ending was hated by a lot of people for fairly obvious reasons. And when I first finished this, I was fascinated by this world and these people, and I hated this ending. Eventually, I kind of came to interpret it as this, like, intentionally ambiguous, you're meant to interpret it and read meanings into this as an allegory kind of ending. Um, and moved on, and then years later the sequel came out and revealed that that was not the case, it's just that they were going to explain it all later in a sequel, which I actually think is a weakness. But uh, yeah, so, the essentialism from, from Golem is questionable, because does that reflect something that this entity within the narrative that serves a thematic purpose is believes, or is that kind of a reflection of essentialisms believed in by the people who made this narrative. This is one of the interesting things about interpreting media, is that you you never have the answer to these questions. Um, but yeah, that's the story of Xenoclash, and uh, I hope you enjoyed coming with me on this journey. This is the end. Any further questions you have can be directed to this guy who stands at the end of the world forever with a telescope, waiting for a Rubik's Cube to rearrange itself. This is actually the point at where... <laughs> There's no kind of end point here. Uh, you just get to sit with a blank screen and the sound of the wind forever. Um, as far as I can tell, it never kind of finishes itself at this point. You have to actually open the menu and quit out of the game manually. This is one of the many strange and janky things about this game, and it's an idiosyncratic choice, but I respect it. So, that's all from me. I hope you've enjoyed this journey. Join me next time for Transistor, or possibly the final episode of Mirror's Edge, which I am still working on. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like and subscribe, and check out the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching.